Okay, I think we can start. So once again, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Open Data in the Humanities and Social Sciences. My name is Melissa and I'm a marketing executive at F1000 and I'm here to provide any technical support in today's session. Before we start, I will be covering some webinar housekeeping. First of all, all participants will be muted throughout the webinar, but please do write your questions in the questions box, which can be found through your call to webinar control panel, which looks like the image that you can see on the slide. Our presenter will be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. However, if your question isn't answered today, we'll be in touch with you shortly after. Also, if for any reason you need to drop off the webinar, that's not a problem as the session is being recorded and will be sent to you a couple of days after the webinar. I will now pass over to Rebecca Grant, Head of Data and Software Publishing at F1000, who will walk you through open data in the humanities and social sciences. Great, thank you so much, Melissa, and thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, so what we're covering in this webinar, um, firstly, I wanted to talk a bit about why data sharing might be considered challenging for researchers in humanities and social sciences. Uh, secondly, just thinking about journals data sharing policies, um, I'm using F1000 as an example, how can HSS researchers comply? Uh, thirdly, how can specific HSS challenges be addressed? So what might be particularly challenging for HSS data? And then finally touching on what fair data means for HSS. I thought it would be useful to look at some stats around some of these challenges. Um, if you're an author in the humanities and social sciences and you don't think that data sharing is challenging, um, then please do add a comment to the chat box, um, add a question because I think Currently, the perception is that, generally speaking, this can be a bit more difficult for humanities and social sciences researchers. Um, so I have a few stats. This is from a survey conducted in spring of this year by the STM Association's Humanities uh, Data Subgroup, asking authors about their perception of data sharing in the humanities, uh, their experiences of data sharing. So one of the first questions we asked was whether humanity, humanities authors recognize the term research data as a supporting output of their research process. So is data something that humanities authors think is relevant to them? And you can see slightly more than half said yes. Um, maybe just over a third saying sometimes it's relevant and then smaller proportion saying no. Um, so on the whole, I think more than we expected, humanities authors are recognising that sometimes their research generates data, although obviously a bit of bias here as these were authors who chose to respond to a survey about humanities data sharing. Um, also interesting and coming from the same survey, we asked uh, how these humanities authors had shared their research data with others if they had done so. Um, and you can see the large majority had shared data by personal or email transfer, and then less than half as many had shared data in a data repository, slightly fewer sharing on a website. So actually there's quite a lot of activity happening in terms of humanities data sharing, although it's not necessarily in the form that we would consider to be best practice. So I think we would ideally like to increase the number of uh, humanities authors using data repositories, maybe decrease sharing by email. And I'll talk a bit about why that is. Um, also, just thinking about social scientists. So this is from a different survey. This is the state of open data. Um, it's not focused specifically on social science researchers, but I think it illustrates the type of challenge that is most relevant to them. Uh, so the question asked was what problems or concerns uh, these researchers had with sharing data sets. And you can see the second highest reason for concern was that the data might contain sensitive information or require permission uh, from the research participants before it could be shared. Um, and you can see how that would be uh, quite a challenge for researchers in social sciences specifically. Uh, so looking at HSS as a whole, I, I actually think it's more useful to um, split humanities from social sciences. 
Um, but we can start to see, like in my own experience and in some of the data that we have access to, there are challenges emerging. Um, on the humanities side, I think often it's this idea of data not being relevant. It's not clear what data means to a humanities researcher. Um, additionally, humanities researchers more likely to be using third party sources in their research, possibly um, using sources still in copyright, sources that aren't generated by the researcher themselves. Um, humanities researchers may be less likely to have knowledge of the resources that would help them to share data, so appropriate data repositories, for example. Um, and then on the social sciences side, as we already touched on, um, these researchers are generally working with human research participants um, and intrinsically there is a need to protect those participants, protect their identities and their privacy. Um, in social sciences, maybe more likely to be researching sensitive topics, so things like uh, sexuality or alcohol dependency, um, and you definitely don't want to release that data uh, when you shouldn't be. Um, and finally, participant consent for sharing is really important. So if you have generated a data set, you come to publish in a journal, you're prompted to share the data and you don't have permission from your participants, then you really shouldn't be sharing that data openly. And across humanities and social sciences, I think there is generally a lack of experience in data sharing when you compare perhaps to the life sciences. Not to say that HSS researchers don't share their data or don't know how to, but generally speaking, probably less likely to have done this in the past. But before we go any further, I wanted to make sure that we're all thinking about what HSS data is in the same way. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can define research data. Um, these are some of the ways that I find most useful when thinking about what data means in humanities and social sciences. Um, so firstly, thinking about the source. Um, when you're publishing in a journal and you're asked to share your data, uh, that could be data that's been generated by you, the researcher. So perhaps during your research process, you created a data set, uh, but equally it could be data that was generated by a third party. So if you used something like an existing survey or census data, then that's something you didn't create, but it does underpin the findings of your research. And this means that in the humanities and social sciences and across other disciplines too, we can think of research data as being the input or the output of the research process. So it's not always something that you've created yourself. Um, in terms of medium, um, I think we often think about research data as being digital, but it could equally be physical, particularly in a humanities and social science uh, context. Um, so you might be working with uh, physical materials, perhaps you are working with digital materials, or perhaps you're working with digitized materials, so something that was physical and now has a digital copy. Um, and then in terms of format, really wide range. So thinking about HSS, it could be something like archival documents, museum objects, uh, audio files, uh, AV, so audiovisual material, images, transcripts, field notes, survey results. It really depends on the research method that you're using, um, but we would take a very inclusive view of what counts as research data. Um, so I had a quick look across some Taylor and Francis journals to see what kind of HSS data sets were being shared. And there's a real uh, diversity of data types. Um, so this is a random sample, but I thought it was quite illustrative. Um, so for example, in the first article, uh, the authors are talking about using archival resources from British banks. Uh, the second used digitized materials from The Times and The Economist, so those are UK newspapers. Uh, the third is looking at evidence for Neanderthal healthcare. Uh, the fourth was looking at war trophies being exhibited in local shop windows. And the final one was an examination of a particular band's concert appearances, uh, their musical output and any printed matter associated with them. So you can see, um, I think, again, especially compared to life sciences, there's a real diversity of data types and you can start to understand why it's not always easy for researchers to identify exactly what their data might be. 
Um, so I wanted to do a quick poll before we move on, and I'll ask Melissa to launch it in a second. So the question is, have you shared your research data before? Um, so this will pop up on your screen and you can provide an answer. So you could say, yes, you have, no, you haven't, uh, maybe you're not sure, um, or maybe you're sitting in on this webinar, but you don't work with or create research data. So you can say that too. Um, so Melissa, could you launch the poll when you're ready? Okay, so that should yeah. pop up on your screens. Thanks. It has. Let's wait a couple of uh, seconds so that our participants uh, can submit their vote. Okay, I'm closing the poll in, uh, in a second. So Rebecca, 34% uh, have answered uh, yes, 44% no, 10% I'm not sure, and 11% I don't work with or create research data. Okay, thank you. Um, so just over a third of people saying that they have done this before. Again, if you wanted to uh, make any comment about your experience or anything that you did find difficult in that process, then please add it to uh, the chat box or you can add it as a Q&A question. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so just to frame the rest of this discussion, I thought it would be useful to have a look at the F1000 Open Data Guidelines. Um, so F1000 provides a number of publishing platforms, uh, including F1000 Research, publishing across disciplines, including the humanities and social sciences. Um, and our platforms, which are equivalent to journals, have some of the most stringent data sharing policies of any publisher. Um, so if you're publishing with us, there are a number of things you need to do with your research data uh, before you'll be accepted for publication. Um, this is kind of a high level overview, but I'll go through all of these in a bit more depth. Um, so in terms of making your data accessible, we do expect that you put your data into a data repository. Uh, so it has to be openly available on the web. We also ask you to write a data availability statement that explains where the data can be found. We want to make sure that all of the data you share can be reused. Uh, so that means you need to apply an open license to it. And I'll talk more about what that means. We ask you to make your data fair. Again, I'll talk more about what that means. Uh, we also want to make sure that if you go to the trouble of sharing the data, that you get credit for having done so. So we expect you to cite your data in the body of your article and also to add it to your reference list, similar to a bibliographic reference. And then because the data has been made fully open, we do also ask peer reviewers to access the data and assess it as part of their peer review process. Um, so you can keep this in mind as we talk through what some of these requirements mean and then later what some of this might mean for a humanities or social sciences researcher, what might be a little bit different. Um, so I'll just go through these in a little bit more depth um, and then we'll come on to talk about HSS specifically. So the first one, and this is probably the biggest thing that you need to do if you're sharing your data openly, is to deposit that data into a data repository. Uh, if you haven't used a data repository before, it's basically a location on the web for research data to be stored and accessed by others. Um, the idea being that this will be preserved over time, it's a bit more secure and more long lasting than putting data on a website. That's what makes repositories a bit different. Uh, the repository should allow you to provide contextual information so the data can be reused. So it will prompt you to add a bit of information about the data that you've uploaded. And it will provide you with a persistent identifier. So for example, a DOI so that you can cite data as I already mentioned. Um, so there's literally thousands of data repositories available for you to use. Mostly they are free of charge. Some have conditions around who can deposit. Um, and they also are sometimes grouped by uh, kind of disciplinary focus. So for example, the ICPSR would be more social sciences, whereas Figshare uh, would be uh, available for anyone in any discipline to use. So I just, included some logos of ones that you might have come across before if you have used a data repository. 
Um, if you haven't used a data repository before and you're not sure how to choose one, we do provide a list of recommended repositories. Um, and you can see on the left-hand column, we will tell you what type of data this is appropriate for. Um, so for example, you can see if you had social and economic data, you might choose to use the UK data service. Whereas, as I said, Figshare will take any type of data. Um, this is a much longer list on our website. Uh, so if there were other data types that you were thinking about, um, there should be something appropriate for you on that list. Our next policy requirement is writing a data availability statement. So having deposited that data into a repository, uh, we need you to tell us and to tell your readers where the data is. Um, so you would do this in your data availability statement, which is at F1000, a required section of the manuscript. Um, it's basically a paragraph and it should explain uh, all of the data underpinning the research and where it can be found. So I have a little example here. You can see it's very short. In this case, the authors have included their um, underlying data and they've told us that it's an excavation report of a shipwreck and they've included this link, the handle, that's the persistent identifier uh, where that data set should always be found. Um, and you can see uh, data availability statements, they'll work for any data type. So if you're coming from the humanities and social sciences, um, you should be able to describe whatever you were using, um, no matter what it was. So on the left hand side, you can see this is a real data availability statement um, that's been published on F1000. Um, and in this case, the author was looking at a collection of archival documents called the papers of Victor Webb. In this case, actually, they're not digitized. They are held by the University of Glasgow Archives and Special Collections. Um, and if you want to go and look at this collection, you need to go to the search room and see it in person. And you can see the author has told us a bit about how to make an appointment and also some access restrictions on that collection as well. Um, so if you're doing that kind of research that uses um, an archival collection, you can still describe that in your data availability statement. There's no problem with doing that. Not everything is in a data repository. Uh, the middle one is a little bit different. So this is more of a traditional data set. Um, the authors generated it themselves. It's looking at um, meter in poetry and how it affects memory. And you can see they've said that they've deposited the data into a repository called OSF. Meter and memory is the name of that data set. And then they've included their persistent identifier, in this case, a DOI. Um, and then finally, these authors have used third party survey data. So they've used um, an existing survey. Again, they didn't create this themselves. Um, this data, again, is not in a data repository. It's on a website, um, but that's fine. They can just describe how they accessed the data and under what conditions they accessed it. Um, so you can see actually these data availability statements can be very flexible. If you didn't uh, necessarily use data from a repository or deposit data into a repository, you can still describe how the data can be accessed. Um, so our next policy requirement is open licenses. Um, as I said, if you did generate your own data, we do expect you to put an open license on it so that it can be reused. Um, a license is just telling other people what can be done with your published data or code, although they're applicable to any creative work. It's not just data that can be licensed. Uh, you may have come across uh, the Creative Commons licenses before. So this is a set of standardized licenses that any researcher can use. So if you want to tell others what can be done with your data, you're not sure what format that can take, most repositories will allow you to apply this standard Creative Commons license. Um, so again, you may have seen some of these before. Uh, Creative Commons provides a set of different licenses with varying restrictions in terms of reuse. So some of them are really permissive. They don't restrict anything. Um, some of them are a bit more restrictive and they will prevent reuse for things like um, commercial purposes. Um, and you might have seen, uh, if you've published on a journal with a data policy before, often publishers will be directing you to choose one of these more permissive licenses. Uh, so a public domain dedication, it's not really a license, it's basically releasing your data into the public domain 
uh, before the term of copyright would have expired. And that means there's absolutely no restrictions on what somebody can do with your data. It can be reused for any purpose. Um, attribution only or CC BY is slightly more restrictive. Again, somebody can reuse the data for any purpose, but they will need to give you credit as the data creator. Um, so you'll see this at other publishers, but at F1000, we do require you to apply one of these licenses to data that you generate. Um, so when we think about applying a license, um, it's actually something that happens outside of publishing the research article. The license is actually applied in the data repository. So I have a quick example here. Uh, this is a data repository called Zenodo. Um, the title of the data set that's been deposited um, is developing a transformational digital strategy in an SME. And you can see down here on the right hand side, the authors have given us a bit of information about this data set. So we know it's been published on the 3rd of July 2020. We have a DOI to persistently identify it. And then they've applied this license to the files, which is Creative Commons Attribution. So it's that CC BY license. So if you're looking to see what license a data set has, you should usually be looking in the data repository. And that's also where you'll apply the license. Um, and then finally, data citation. So this is the idea of getting credit for having shared. Um, possibly you haven't done this before. It's still not very common across journals, but it is really equivalent to a standard bibliographic citation. So if you've cited um, a bibliographic reference in your reference list, then you can easily cite data too. And the idea is that it allows credit to be given when data sets are reused. So that could be credit to you if you're citing your own data set. It could be credit to um, another data set creator if you reused somebody else's data. Um, so we can see our example here. We have a data set called Home Food Growing, Wellbeing and Food Security during the COVID-19 UK lockdown. So if we just have a closer look at how this is structured, we have B Mead, and that's our creator's name, our home food growing, uh, that's the name of the data set. OSF is actually the data repository where it's held. 2021 is the date that this was published. And then at the bottom, we have our DOI, which is our persistent link to the data set. So the structure of these data citations is actually very similar to what you would use for a standard bibliographic reference. Um, you might be thinking, well, that's fine uh, if the data is in a repository, but what if I used something else? Uh, we also have guidance on providing citations for cultural heritage collections. This can be maybe slightly more difficult or more confusing if you've used something that's been digitized. Um, so a project called Heritage PIDs has provided guidance on what you should do. And just to... Uh, Give you a high level overview they're saying you should cite the digital version if that's what you used so don't cite the physical version uh, if the um, cultural heritage organization that you access the data from has given you a suggested citation you should use it and always use a persistent link if you can so don't just grab the url from your browser um, and all of this guidance is embedded into our um, hss data policies at f1000 Okay, so I think we've got a bit of a high level overview of what a data policy might be asking you to do, um, but where does this intersect with those HSS data challenges that we identified? I've just picked a couple of examples and I'll run through what this might mean for you if this is the type of data that you are trying to share. Um, so firstly, coming back to this idea of working with human research participants, and I think this is one of the areas that authors find most concerning when they encounter a strong data sharing policy. Um, so if this is the kind of research you were doing, you might be thinking, well, my participants didn't consent to sharing their data. Maybe you're concerned about legal implications, for example, GDPR legislation. Maybe you're thinking about how the data could be anonymized. Maybe you're thinking the topic of the study is just too sensitive and it just cannot be shared. Um, so fortunately, there's a lot you can do to make sure that this data can be shared. Um, however, you do really need to start planning for data sharing in advance. This is something you should do before your research study begins. So keep it in mind for next time if you haven't done it for your current study. Um, so if you plan for data sharing in advance, that means that you will already know that you need to seek consent for sharing from your participants. 
Uh, usually you would then go through a processing, uh, for example, anonymization um, in order to make the data set less identifiable, um, or you might choose to share it in a controlled access repository, and I'll talk about what that means. Um, and then when you do come to publish, having gotten your participant consent, you can also describe any sharing limitations in your data availability statement. So really the key thing here is planning in advance. Um, just to touch on data anonymization, because I know it's something that not everyone has done. So this is a process that would remove uh, particular bits of information from a data set to ensure that the research participants can't be identified. Uh, there's two types of information that you might look to remove from your data set. So direct identifiers would be information that uniquely identify a research participant. So things that are so identifying that just by seeing this one piece of information in the data set, that person could potentially be re-identified. That would include things like their full names, dates of birth, their address, phone number, and any biometric information. Um, in addition, you want to think about indirect identifiers. So this is information which, when combined, would uniquely identify a research participant. Um, so there's a much broader range um, of information that can be an indirect identifier. Uh, for example, ethnicity, sex, place of birth, job title. So for example, if I was your research participant and I was a part of your data set and you knew that I was Irish and female and I had been born in Dublin and my job title was head of data and software publishing at F1000, you can see how in combination I'm actually pretty identifiable. So this is something else you need to think about. Uh, there's a variety of techniques that you can use to do this. So you might choose to just remove a varial completely. So something like date of birth, you might just take out. Uh, you can generalize. So for example, um, instead of having someone's full address, you might just include their city. Uh, pseudonymization is useful for qualitative data. So you might swap names around. And you can also create bandings. So for things like date of birth, you might swap that to an age range. Um, for salary, you might do a salary range just to show you how this looks in practice. Um, really small example of a quantitative data set on the left. So you can see instead of names, we now have participant codes. So their real names are no longer included. In column B, we've decided we'll just remove date of birth. That's not uh, necessary to interpret the results. We've added an age banding. Um, so replacing the date of birth with the age band. And then our location has been generalized. So no addresses, um, but including regions of the UK. Qualitative data can be a bit more, uh, I wouldn't say it's more difficult, um, but it's kind of a different process. So you can see here, things are being replaced and we are using diacritic marks to indicate that something has been replaced or generalized. So for example, instead of including the name of the university that this interviewee has given, we've just indicated that they had said, this is the name of their university and it's in a particular region. Um, and I think the important thing here is to make sure you're indicating what's been changed and also to make sure that what's remaining, so given enough context, the person is not still identifiable based on what they're saying about themselves. Um, if you feel like anonymization won't work for you, there are other options. So the first is controlled access repositories. Um, again, it's similar to a standard data repository, uh, but it allows you to control who has access. It's not completely open on the web and you can set certain conditions for access. So you might only want somebody affiliated with the university to uh, be allowed access to the data. Um, what you can also do sometimes is set embargoes. So for example, you could set an embargo until your research participant has passed away, for example, and I've seen examples of that. Um, alternatively, you might have something that's so sensitive uh, that you feel you can't even deposit it into a controlled access repository. And in that case, most publishers, including F1000, will allow you to use a valid policy exception to restrict access. Um, so no publisher is going to force you to openly share data that would risk your research participants. Generally, policies will have exceptions to allow you to avoid doing that, but we would expect you to describe any access conditions in your data availability statement. So on the whole, there's a few techniques that you can use, but what you should always keep in mind that, that you don't need to share something if it's not appropriate. You should never feel that you are being forced to share openly when you know that you're risking your research participants. Okay, so our second example, this uh, is maybe more 
uh, kind of humanities focused. Uh, so maybe you're thinking uh, you use someone else's data set, they don't have an open license on it, what should you do? Um, or maybe you used a different type of data. So for example, something from a library collection, like how does that fit with the idea of writing a data availability statement or writing a data citation? Um, so our first example, I mean, really any researcher in any discipline can reuse somebody else's data if they want to. Um, so this is really applicable across the board. We have an example here of a data set in the repository Figshare. So this is a series of interviews that have been transcribed and uploaded. Um, and I can download that from Figshare. It's completely open um, and I can reuse it if I want to. And I can see that the uh, creators of this data set have applied a license to it. It's CC by NC. So that's one of our more restrictive licenses that will prevent commercial reuse. Um, so how does this work if you're publishing on a journal that requires CC BY, this license seems a bit restrictive. Um, actually, it's fine to cite what you used. So if you've reused someone's data, even if they haven't licensed it as openly as we would like, that's okay. You don't have control over that. So all you can do is cite the source that you used um, and your journal, again, will have a policy that allows exceptions to the license because we know that you don't have control over somebody else's data. So secondly, kind of a similar example, but maybe a bit more humanity specific. Um, what happens if you've used other types of source, not necessarily from a data repository? Uh, this is an example of a photograph from a collection at the National Library of Ireland. So you can see it's a picture of the Good Shepherd Convent near Ross. There's a group of children there. So we can access the image via the National Library. Um, they've also given us some descriptive information about this record so we can see who created it, when it was first published and so on. Um, so you might be thinking, well, okay, but how do I write a data availability statement? This isn't in a repository, it doesn't have a license. How do I write a data citation? Um, but again, really, you're just gonna work with what you have. This is what you used, so all we want you to do is to describe it. Um, and actually, if you have a closer look at the information that the National Library provides, you can build your data citation, you can um, make reference to where it's held. So instead of a repository, we're just going to say this is in the National Library of Ireland, that's where we found it. Um, they do actually tell us um, that the all rights are reserved, so it's not openly licensed, but there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, you can build your data citation using the information that the National Library have given us. And then in the data availability statement, you would just be adding information about the location of this resource, what it's called, the copyright status, similar to the data availability statements that we saw earlier. So all you can do is describe what you used. Um, thing to remember, you should never redeposit third-party sources because you want to change the location to a repository, because you want to apply an open license. Um, no matter what the policy of your journal, you'll never be encouraged to take somebody's data and upload it somewhere else just to conform to the policy requirements. It's absolutely fine to describe these sources just as you found them and um, with the information that you were able to gather. It's more about transparency. How would somebody come and find this thing in the same way that you did? Um, so finally, I wanted to touch on FAIR data. Um, I'm not sure to what extent you will have heard of FAIR data. It's kind of a buzzword now. It's starting to pop up more and more in policies at journals, but also at funders um, and institutions as well. Um, it's a set of principles that's intended to make research data more reusable by others. And the acronym stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. So this idea of FAIR data is embedded in our F1000 open data policy. Um, so you might encounter it there and you might wonder, okay, well, what does this really mean? What does this mean for me as a humanities or social sciences author? Um, I think one of the challenges with the FAIR data principles, and this is across the board, not just for humanities and social sciences, is a lack of familiarity. So we do know that when authors come to publish with us, they see this requirement for FAIR data. It's quite possible that they don't really understand what the FAIR principles mean for them. So again, looking at some stats from the State of Open Data Survey, 
uh, we can see 66% of the respondents said they'd heard of them uh, and 28% said they were familiar with them. So less than a third saying that they really understand what these principles mean. At the same time, um, the researchers were asked to what extent they thought that their data was compliant with FAIR. And you can see 22% of people are saying very much compliant and 32% saying somewhat. So this to me indicates maybe a lack of understanding of what the FAIR principles mean. Okay, so you might be wondering, okay, well, what are these principles? What do they look like? Um, so I've um, copied the full uh, FAIR principles here. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I think it's clear when you have a quick look that they're very technical. Um, so you can see words here like metadata, um, indexing, searchable resource, standardized communications protocol, uh, language for knowledge representation. Like I think, again, across disciplines, these are not a very user-friendly set of principles and it, I think it can be very challenging for authors encountering them to know exactly what they're being asked to do. Um, so to address this, and this is specifically for humanities and social sciences as part of our F1000 policies, um, we've provided some more practical guidance in terms of what FAIR data actually means and what you are required to do. So for example, to make data findable, we will guide you to our recommended repositories list. We'll provide a little bit of guidance on the descriptive metadata that should accompany it. Um, for example, for interoperable, we're guiding you towards open file formats and using a resource called fairsharing.org to find what kind of standards apply to your data type. Um, if you're interested, um, there's an excellent report that was published by uh, the eHumanities Working Group at ALEA called Sustainable and Fair Data Sharing in the Humanities. Um, so it is humanities rather than social sciences focused, but I think it's just a very accessible way of learning more about fair data. If that's something that you're interested in doing, I would recommend it. Um, I also wanted to mention, if this is something that you're interested in, if you're coming from the humanities and social sciences and thinking, um, like, how does this all apply to me? Like, how are these data policies relevant? We launched a platform in F1000 called Routledge Open Research in the spring. So this was a joint um, platform supported by F1000 and Routledge, which is part of Taylor and Francis. And it's dedicated to education, psychology, the arts, humanities, and social sciences. And what's different about this platform is that we have um, a full open data policy and set of guidelines that's tailored specifically to humanities and social sciences. So all of the guidance that you'll see on Routledge Open Research has been written completely from a humanities and social sciences perspective and is giving you guidance that you as a humanities or social sciences researcher should be able to follow. Um, so kind of none of that life sciences language is in there. All of the uh, resources provided are relevant just to humanities and social sciences. So if you're interested, I'd really encourage you to take a look at Routledge Open Research and see what you think of the data guidelines. Um, additionally, I didn't want to talk all the way through about how we can share data in humanities and social sciences and not to talk about why. Um, I suppose at a high level, the reason that journals ask authors to share data is more about transparency and depending on the discipline, replicability. Uh, but there are some other reasons that you might be interested in sharing your data openly. Uh, the first one is around, I mean, we say credibility, but again, it is more about making your methodology transparent, potentially to be recreated by others, but that's not necessarily always relevant in humanities and social sciences. Um, it's more about allowing somebody to follow your method and your thought process and to see what was um, either the input or the output at every stage of that. Uh, secondly, to enhance the visibility of your work. So if you publish your article in a journal or an F1000 platform and you publish your data set in a data repository, that means that your research can be found through both routes. Um, so people will have access to your research, whether they're looking in the repository or they're browsing the journal. Uh, thirdly, to ensure credit for creators. Um, so obviously 
if your data is cited, you're getting credit as the person who created it. Um, but I think it's also really important that we provide credit to the cultural heritage organisations who are providing these digitised materials um, to us. Uh, that was one of the aims of that Heritage PIDS project I mentioned, to ensure that cultural heritage organisations do get credit for making these resources available. And then, of course, giving credit to other researchers in your discipline as well, if you did reuse their data. Um, and then finally, around progressing your career, I'm not sure to what extent this is proven to be relevant to HSS, although I'd be interested to um, hear your experiences. But there is evidence that openly sharing data in repositories is associated with an increase of citations to your published paper of up to 25%. So if you choose to share the data underpinning your research in a data repository, you could expect up to 25% more citations to your paper. And this was a large scale study conducted in 2020 um, at BNC and PLOS journals. Um, and then finally, uh, just a paper that I enjoy, it's not HSS focused, but I think it's still interesting, is uh, five selfish reasons to work reproducibly by Florian Markovets. So he's talking about uh, the benefits that you get as a researcher if you set yourself up to work in a way that's reproducible and that involves sharing your data. So again, um, take a look at that if you're interested. Okay, so one final poll, I think, before we go to uh, Q&A. Um, so I'll ask Melissa to launch this in a moment. So I wanted to check, having kind of gone through some examples, uh, talked about uh, some of our policy requirements, are there any areas of data sharing that you would still like to learn more about, um, bearing in mind that we touched on some of these quite briefly? Uh, so your options are learning more about sensitive human data, uh, learning more about data repositories, learning more about data licensing and copyright. Uh, maybe you'd like to learn more about something else, and in which case, please do add that to the chat or the Q&A box. Um, or maybe you want to say nothing, everything was covered, which would be great, <laughs> but don't feel pressured to choose that one. Um, so Melissa, if you could launch that poll when you're ready. Okay, I've launched the poll. And now again, we're going to wait for a couple of uh, seconds until uh, our participants have uh, voted. Okay, now I'm closing the poll. So, Rebecca, 38% uh, have voted sensitive human data, 22% uh, data repositories, and it's the same actual percentage for data licensing and copy copywriting, 8% something else, and 11% nothing, everything was covered. Oh, thanks to everyone who said everything was covered. <laughs> um, that's really helpful, thank you. So if we're thinking about running future uh, sessions, then it's really good to know what people would be most interested in learning more about. Um, okay, so we will move on. Um, so we have some further reading here. So um, this is from our uh, Routledge Open Research Guidelines, actually. So if you were interested in coming back and taking a look, um, this is linked from the slide. Um, oops. So uh, you might have seen on your go to control panel, there's a little drop down called handouts, and that will actually give you a PDF version of the slides that we've just been through. So if there were any links you wanted to click on and you were interested in um, having access to them after the webinar, do download that handout. Um, I think once the webinar ends, you lose your opportunity. So make sure you download it before we finish up, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, okay, so I think we are ready to go to questions. 